Welcome back to the Anxiety Slayer podcast. I'm Shan Vanderleek, here with my good friend and co-host, Ananga Sevier. Today we're discussing how choice creates your life experience, how to practice asking yourself the question, in this moment, is this choice going to bring me stress or more peace? In other words, what future is this choice creating? Hey, Ananga, how you doing? Hey, Shan. It's good to be with you today to talk about making choices that support anxiety recovery. Often when we're living with anxiety, we can feel pinned by it and we feel that we're stuck with it. This is something we hear a lot in our private Facebook group and messages we receive. I can remember earlier in my life, in my teenage years and early 20s, when I used to suffer with strong anxiety, feeling that that was just me that there was something wrong with me, and that was it. That was how I was going to have to, I couldn't even call it live, I would say exist. So when I started looking into ways of finding help and discovered that there are so many things we can do, even changing our behaviours and our attitudes that can help us live a more peaceful life and help us find freedom from anxiety, that was a huge thing for me. So I think this is a helpful thing to discuss. And it really begins with checking in with yourself and choosing differently. Checking in with ourselves and noticing where we're at. If we have heightened emotions, if we're feeling extra jangly or full of fear, and then what choices those emotions and and feelings provoke. Mm. Sometimes initially, we might not know. And that's okay. This is the beginning of a process. Sometimes we're starting when we do this to do this very differently. It might be a new thing for us. So at least being open to the possibility of choice. Sometimes our mind is going to really argue with us when we try and do this. Sometimes we feel very definitely stuck and that nothing's working. And we might just need to hold the possibility that there are different choices, even if we don't know what they are yet. Loosen it up a little bit. Maybe it can be different. Maybe I can do a few things differently. I was talking to you, Shan, before we started recording about a wonderful book I'm reading at the moment from a spiritual practitioner who's lived with a a lot of pain and illness. And she talks about dialoguing with illness and asking for the message in different symptoms that she experiences. And she shares the point that you don't always get an answer. It might come in a dream. It might come later. But she also shared quite a string of answers that she's received over the years as she became more sensitive to that, more comfortable with that process. So that's something we can also do with anxiety. Rather than trying to numb it out or busy ourselves, distract ourselves, or getting caught in that loop of suffering to ask, okay, I'm listening. What are you trying to tell me? What's the message here? That's a very potent way to address it. I think we all can learn from that. It's very much the same way as dropping in and paying attention to our body, paying attention to the thoughts in our head and the awareness that not all of the thoughts in our head are even ours. The messages that come through and the, you know, oftentimes anxiety could be excitement. And at the time, you don't really know the difference between the two or how to untangle the difference between the two. And there are things that, that you can do when that comes up that allow you to move through it with just a little bit more grace. By being in the question. Yeah. And and again, I think that's about broadening or opening to an increased palette of experiences. Sometimes we've got very primary colors with our emotions, but we know that the purpose of primary colors is that they can mix beautifully to create a whole palette, a whole amazing array of colors. So just being open to that, that sometimes when we have a sensation in our body, we will be accustomed to it being related to anxiety, if we're suffering from anxiety and particularly health anxiety, we're going to be hypervigilant possibly about that. Certainly vigilant. We're looking. 
And you just reminded me of a question we had years ago, some time ago now, from somebody that was lifting something heavy. I think he was moving an old TV into the back of a van and he started to get um, elevated heart rate and started to feel short of breath and immediately felt that he was going to have a panic attack when really what was happening was he was overexerted from lifting something heavy up high into a van. But the mind had associated it with the previous anxiety episode. But once he understood that, he was able to pull the two apart and realize, no, this is the body doing its thing from lifting something heavy. It's not the same. It feels the same, but the context is different. And that's where looking and asking questions opens up this, this range of possibility that sometimes we experience things and they're not anxiety, and sometimes we experience things and they're not symptoms of concern. So it gives us a bit more breathing room. Mm, yeah, more of a, an ability to, to trust ourselves as well. Yeah, and to respond rather than react. We talk about how inaction is always contributing to anxiety. And we've mentioned many, many times about how we retreat or how we make ourselves smaller or the things that we do when we're feeling anxious that put us in that place of inertia. And I learned from you that Ayurveda says that inertia is related to fear. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, it comes in a category, um, a quality of nature called tamagun. In Ayurveda, we have the different body types and we have different qualities of nature called sattva, rajas, and tamas. So sattva is uh, peaceful, it's light, it's happy, it has confidence in choice, good peace of mind, clarity. Sattva has clarity. Rajas is more passionate, not romantically just doing, achieving, um, ambitious, active, and, and tends to result in us feeling frustrated, dissatisfied. That's the energy you see in cities. It's the energy you see on motorways, this what Ayurveda calls rajasic energy, the energy of doing. And then we have this other energy, tamas or tamaguna, guna meaning quality, which is a, an energy of inertia and it's presiding Emotion is fear, fearfulness, uh, self-preservation, but in a fearful way. And it's a place where we can get very stuck and we struggle to make good choices and we can get quite held by that energy. So Ayurveda teaches that if we're feeling some inertia, we feel frozen and we're feeling fearful, then it prescribes moving. Mm -hmm. getting in a shower, take a shower, put clean clothes on, put light colors on. All of these qualities also have colors associated to them. And, and tamagun, the lower energy, tends to be dark, black colors, heavier colors. So put light colors on, go for a walk, eat something fresh, you know, be with that up, clean energy. Otherwise, it will hold us in a state of a state of fear because that's its accompanying emotional state. There's a whole science to this. This is really the background of Ayurvedic psychology is to, to really look at these qualities along with our doshas, and it gives us this broad palette of possible experiences. Yeah. But remedially, Ayurveda tries to help us come up through these modes, through these gunas. So we want to come up to sattva gun, which is peaceful. So um, Ayurveda prescribes good company, uplifting company, a bright, clean environment, a bright, clean diet and attitudes. Which is so different than what we often hear from our listeners who want to retreat slash escape from how they're feeling, to escape from that fear by you know, trying to, to sleep or numb themselves in, in any way they can. Yeah, and we all have that. We all have days like that. We all have moments like that. We're none of us immune to that. Yeah. And that is the influence 
of that energy because these these qualities have influence over us. So when that tamagun has influence over us, we're quite held in its grip. It's not an easy thing to come out of. Mm -mm. And it can feel very familiar to know how to operate under that energy. For example, I will check with myself if I feel the need to go and curl up. I will ask myself, is this a retreat? Is this a need for rest? Is it a little depressive? Am I wanting to escape? Am I a bit done with everything and I just want everything to go away and I just want to put a quilt over my head? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is all about questioning and looking at how things are serving us and then asking, okay, if you go do that, how are you going to feel afterwards? What's your intention? What's your emotion around it? And how do you think you're going to feel when you've done it? And sometimes we might be better served by taking a walk or taking a shower or phoning a friend or making sure we've had something to drink, doing something else, listening to something wonderful and uplifting, doing something else, but asking rather than just being on uh, automatic pilot. You made notes about the doing cure from uh, poet Michael Rosen. What's that all about? This is something I read recently in the, uh, the Guardian newspaper. It was a wonderful interview with a poet called Michael Rosen, who had lost his son 20 years ago. He shares um, something he calls the doing cure, which really spoke to me as, again, a remedy of this lower energy, this tamagun that can hold us. And he spoke of the joy of just doing the most simple, simple tasks that are taking care of things. It might be pulling some weeds in the garden, painting something. Here yesterday, we had some sunshine for the first time in a while, and I went out and checked on my herb pots and had a little bit of a cleanup outside just for a few minutes, but I felt so good for it to take care of something, take care of some small tasks. So that's his reference to the doing cure, is the little things we can do that just help us keep going, mm -hmm. keep forward, even when we may have suffered something catastrophically painful. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be catastrophic either. It could just be one of those days, one of those challenging days where if you can do even one thing, that might be everything. Yeah, definitely. I um, always respect people that share simple processes when they've been through big things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. And sometimes we do, we wake up and feel like we can't face the day ahead. We might feel overwhelmed. Everything might feel too much. The mind might be objecting in our head and saying, I just don't want to do anything. Yeah, there are days when the simplest thing, having a shower, putting on clean clothes, it's a triumph. It's a good thing to do. And those things need to be acknowledged and noted because they are the little steps forward. It's one of the reasons why I still love to make lists, mm. even though there's so much of our, our worlds now are online and our calendars and all of that. But being able to cross something off of a list on a day where I might be a little bit sideways is, uh, there's just something about it. There's, it. It comes back into this, oh, you know what? That's good. And if you can do that, maybe you can do this next thing. Anxiety Slayer is sponsored by BetterHelp. There is no question that when you're feeling good, you can experience a sense of being in the flow of life. But sometimes life can throw you a curveball, and you might find that you need some extra help, some extra support. Back in 2020, when my daughter was going off to college in the throes of the pandemic, I found myself in a challenging place. And working with a therapist helped me settle my mind and settle my worries about her. If you're considering therapy, BetterHelp is an excellent option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Simply fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash Slayer today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Slayer. Let's talk about how there are outside influences on how we make decisions. Sometimes that we're not even aware of until we start really picking it apart and looking at it. And these outside influences can be our parents, authority figures, role models that we look up to, certainly our friends and social groups, and even social media. All of these are areas that influence us, all of these people and places and messaging. And, And if we're not careful, we can get swept away in somebody else's idea about things, somebody else's way of of moving through the world that might not be our own. Yeah, it's that self-inquiry, that self-observation, which is such a key part of Ayurvedic healing, on um, making decisions and choosing influences that are good for us, that serve a higher purpose for us. And again, it's just noticing and adjusting. Um, I read somebody on um, Instagram a few weeks ago that said they'd spent about 45 minutes arranging pens and cups on their desk to have it look right for for an image. Mm. When I read, you know, that's how she's setting it up, I thought, yeah, of course. Of course your desk doesn't look like that. I think my desk right now would look very good on Instagram. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm looking at mine right now like, um... This smattering of of uh, crystals and oils and this sweet little calendar I have, but none of it's neat. You know, it's just kind of uh, all over the place. And I'll neaten it up, but yeah, I don't think I've ever taken a picture of of my desktop. However, and and who wants to see it like this? <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> and that really got me thinking. You know about outside influences and expectations on how we make decisions and choices and how social media doesn't serve us well by always showing the highlights rule, especially on Instagram. It's always the highlights rule. So not to feel pressure or expectation from what others are sharing socially. I think it really, again, it's just an encouragement. And Edith Eager is a great teacher on this. She says, you do you and I'll do me. And it's that individual acceptance. Everyone's allowed their taste, everyone's allowed their opinion, and we are allowed ours too. Mm. And when we're anxious, we can really lose that thread of our own decisions and our own choices. So it's just looking again, how our parents do things, how role models and authorities do things, great. If it's good, and we think it would help us, we can model that. We can borrow the benefits of that. If it doesn't fit with how we like to do things, if it doesn't fit with our nature, then we can set it aside respectfully and explore our own way of making decisions. And it was um, a few decades into my life before I realized that was even a possibility. Mm but it's really life-changing when we do and when we start to work with that. It's important to understand that you get to love what you love and that you embrace what brings you joy and what you enjoy experiencing in your life versus what other people think you ought to be doing or should be doing. There's so much divisiveness right now in our world, and we often kind of get pushed into one team or another, one side or another one, and it doesn't have to be that way either. And we can just kind of carry on with our lives without having to comment on every little thing that comes by. Like I think of social media and all the people who So I put a post up and you don't agree with it. Carry on. Scroll to the next thing. You don't have to tell me what an idiot I am or how that 
point doesn't serve you well or whatever the issue might be, right? Because yep. aren't, aren't we supposed to be kind of keeping this light? We're just kind of showing up, doing our thing. At least that's how I'm looking at it is, it, is either doing business or connecting with my friends, or sharing something funny, trying to keep it light. But even in that lightness, there are, there are things that will come up. And, and then you have young people who are completely devastated when the work that they're putting up or the art that they're posting or whatever they're sharing doesn't get any feedback or, or perhaps gets some, some mean commentary. Uh, all of this stuff is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's okay to pick your lane and enjoy your life and make the choices that you see fit and to do your very, very best not to worry about what other people have to think about it. I know it's easier said than done, but it's a good practice. It's a good practice, and it is a practice. If we're looking at influences, outside influences on how we make decisions, we can also pick up good influences. Mm -hmm. Like I would recommend reading Edith Eager's book, The Gift. Really amazing life lessons and, and healing practices to turn some things around. We mentioned last week I was reading a book called Stolen Focus. I still am making my way through it. But wonderful insights, really eye-opening about the influence of social media and how it affects us and how we can go there for gratification if we're not careful or approval and how that's shaping the lives of young people. So we can do this from, from both sides, looking at the influences that are affecting how we make our own personal decisions and reclaiming the right to make personal decisions. And then if we need a bit of support, looking at some clearing practices, looking at information others are bringing on how we can feel strengthened in uh, making good decisions for ourselves. Now we're going to look into keys to upgrading our choices. Whether it be a strong desire or motivation, whether we need support, whether it be a a practice, something that we can practice in order to upgrade whatever it is we're choosing. And then, of course, mindfulness is always a part of this, too, to be aware, to be mindful, and not be on autopilot. Yeah, I think it begins with picking one thing that we want to change, one thing that we know would support us to change. Um, making a note, as you said earlier, Putting things on paper, ticking them off is very validating. Good old fashioned way of validating our changes. So, mm -hmm. never to overwhelm ourselves, take on too much at once. Pick one or two simple things, check in with our desire and our level of motivation. Um, do we need more support with that, feeling more motivated, or are we good to go? and looking at how we can make that change, and then coming back and checking in, keep it somewhere where you can see it, whatever works for you, which is our next point. Knowing what works for us really is the gold. When, when we want to learn to do something, it's human nature to look at how other people do it. But what we need to know is how we would do it, what serves you well, what serves us well, in this space. I was listening to an interview with uh, the author Margaret Atwood a couple of weeks ago, who I'm sure many of our listeners know who she is. She's, she's very well known. She shared this story. Somebody asked her about her creative process for writing, and she said, it's a bit of a mud pie. I just get this big lump of mud and start shaping it around and developing it as I go. And then she shared that one time she tried to write a book and abandoned it after a good few pages, quite a way in, um, where she'd used an index card method of having all these index cards and characters and scenes and, and plotting, plotting the storyline out, but it really didn't work for her. But she felt she should try it because she'd seen other people doing it that way and it seemed to be the way you did it, which surprised me because she's an incredibly definite, articulate, intelligent person. So that was very interesting to me to see her share that. 
And then the interviewer asked her, you know, was that something somebody else recommended to you? And she she just smiled and said, no, it was a self-inflicted wound. (laughs) (laughs) As they often are, though. As they often are. And then she went on to share the point that learning what didn't work for her was as valuable as learning what does. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, if we do something and it doesn't work out, we don't need to kick ourselves around. We can just ask, how can I do it differently next time? How can I do it in a way that has a better feeling or outcome or whatever it is I'm looking for with that? Next time, lesson learned. Yeah. I think we're so hard on ourselves. We're very hard on ourselves, and and we don't tend to explore what works for us. It's, It's almost as if we are inclined sometimes to deny ourselves autonomy, to deny ourselves choice, Mm. whether it's because we don't know ourselves well enough yet, because we can always learn, or might we not respect ourselves well enough to explore and have our own opinion and our own way of doing things or something else? But really important to get to know ourselves more and know how we need to do things. And this, although we're not using the word anxiety directly so much in this episode, this is a huge antidote to anxiety. It takes away that self indecision. Um, it takes away a lot of procrastination. It, it brings more of that higher state that we discussed earlier. It brings more clarity and it brings more peace. So it is relevant to anxiety, although we're not directly labeling it as such. And it seems to me that the more we get to know ourselves and pay attention to who we are and, and what it is that really brings us joy and what it is that we wish to experience in this lifetime, you start to see more of the anxiety fall away because you're getting more clear about who you really are. And when you're in this place of wanting to know or learn how to do something and look at someone else to do it, that's fine. You might ask, how do you do that? But literally ask how how you do that, not that means that's how I have to do that. So you can take something and tweak it and change it and make it yours very much like uh, Margaret made the mud pie, right? <laughs> we, we might learn from others, but that works best alongside of figuring out our own way forward, unearthing our own way forward, which begins by knowing what our true nature is. Your true nature is not anxiety. That is not who you are. Your true nature is so much more than that. Yeah, and we have things to do in this life, which go so deeper than paying the bills and coping day in, day out, existing with high levels of anxiety. It really does upgrade the quality of our life if we start asking questions and making choices as best we can. And if we know ourselves? We can discover what works for us and what doesn't and save ourselves a lot of time and energy. Let's wrap up our conversation today talking about how we can change our physiology and have a little bit more choice in our emotions. That almost doesn't seem like it's possible sometimes, but it it really is. Yeah, it's another one of those things where you feel like, well, that's it. I feel like this and and that's that. And I think we've all had experiences of that where we feel caught in an emotion or stuck in an emotion, but we can learn to work with them and change them. And we can learn to cultivate and bring in more balanced states. Often we're kind of hunched over and looking down and that makes us more inclined to feel low and we can get stuck like it or habituated. Mm-hmm. To being like it, so we can change our change our body. Changing our body posture changes our emotions, and I, I think that also changing our environment can also help in changing our physiology. Before we started recording today, I was telling you a story about my daughter and I going 
for lunch to a place we'd never been before. And we walked in the door, and the music was so loud, and it was really like hard driving metal music. And, and you know, there's a place for all music, but for lunch on a Saturday afternoon with my daughter, we went in and we thought, okay, well, we, maybe we can sit far away from the speakers. Maybe we can make this work, whatever. And we sat down and I started feeling more and more uncomfortable. I didn't want to be there and I wanted to enjoy time with her. And she was kind of like, yeah, you know, whatever. It'll, it'll move on to another song soon. And the waiter came and brought us water. And I don't know, maybe 30 seconds later, we both decided, you know what, this isn't going to work. And we left. And there would have been a time when I would have just sucked it up or um, told myself something or other. You know, you're already here. He's already brought you the water. Um, it'll be okay. Just stay here. And as soon as we walked outside, so much relief and such a kindness to have not forced myself to endure that. And I think we are often habituated to sitting those things out and and then we we're drained by it and we often carry it with us for a long time afterwards. So that's a great a great example of making that change. I remember many years ago I went to see a, a movie with a friend and um we were just sitting there and this film took such an unexpected dark turn. And we kind of looked at each other <laughs> like, I'm not sure how much more of this I want to take in. And then I thought, but, you know, I've paid to see it. And then just a part of me said, don't pay twice. No doubt. You know, you paid money. Now you're going to pay with disturbance and a waste of time and so many other things. So we got up and walked out. Yeah. But that was quite a realization for me. At that time, I was more habituated to, to sit through things. Mm -hmm. To put up with it. Yeah, put up with it. Yeah. Such a potent way to look after ourselves, to just check in. And again, how do you feel? What do you need? Yeah. So there are just a few good examples, I think, of how you can honor yourself and make choices that are self-honoring. And we realize this is a practice. This is a day-to-day a -day practice, but you deserve to look after yourself and to change your physiology, whatever it is that you need to be more comfortable. If you love our podcast and want to support our work, please consider becoming a patron. You can explore our Patreon for loads of Anxiety Slayer extras for calming anxiety, including exclusive posts, guided meditations, tapping sessions, popular episodes from our archives, and behind-the-scenes conversations. You can learn more at patreon.com forward slash anxiety slayer. We hope you come back again.